Hi, this is Victoria again and welcome to part two of my Sabbath series. In part two I will be dealing with specific verses and passages that people use to try to quote end quote prove Sunday worship or prove that the Sabbath has been done away with entirely. So, okay, let me minimize the windows on my computer. I'll be reading these, but these were written by me. Uh, start my stopwatch there. Okay, first one is claim. In John 5.17, Jesus says it's okay to work on the Sabbath because he and his father do. And uh, all, ver all verses will be from the New American Standard Version, which is my preferred version. Okay, uh, for this reason the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. And that's John 5, 16 through 17. Okay, my response. The real question in this passage is the definition of what is work. What kind of work is Jesus and his father engaged in? The Jews felt that he was engaged in work that was not lawful on the Sabbath, for, as we can see from verse 18. But we know that Jesus was sinless, so he was not actually doing anything unlawful, and there is nothing in the Old Testament that mitigates against healing on the Sabbath, which is the charge the Jews leveled against him. In fact, Jesus says it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath, Matthew 12:12. 12, 12. So what is the work Jesus and his Father were doing? I contend that in keeping with the healing motif, the work in this passage is redemptive work, the work of healing the human condition and soul. This is work that God has been engaged in since the fall and will be engaged in until Jesus comes back. I'm sorry, that's the fax machine. Just ignore it. <laughs> this is work that Jesus has been engaged in since the fall and will be engaged in until Jesus comes back. This is work that is lawful on the Sabbath for the same reason the priests work harder on the Sabbath than any other day in the temple and yet were held guiltless. Ah. Okay. Let me quote Samuel Bakayoki since he is much more the scholar than I. And this is from his book The Sabbath in the New Testament page 296 to 297. God ended on the Sabbath his act of creation, but not his action in general. Because of sin, he is, quote, because of sin, he is working until now to accomplish the salvation of the human race. Christ's act of healing represents a link in the great chain of, God, of God's saving acts accomplished here on earth and consequently it does not contradict but fulfills the spirit of the Sabbath. By linking his healing act to the saving Sabbath activity of the Father, Christ was actually saying to his adversaries, in accusing me you are really reproaching the legislator himself since I only act in harmony with his precepts and example. So that answers, I hope, any questions on John 5:17 and whether or not that whether or not John 5:17 says it's okay to work on the Sabbath? It does not. It's dealing with redemptive work, not work in general. Okay. Acts 15 commands the Gentiles to do only three things. Sabbath keeping is not one of them, therefore Gentiles do not have to keep the Sabbath. And this is the passage. Therefore it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols, and from fornication, and from what is strangled, and from blood verses 19 through 20. Chapter 15, this is my response, chapter 15 deals with the question of whether the Gentiles had to become Jews in order to become Christians. Of course, the answer to that was and is no. The Pharisees wanted the Gentiles circumcised and obeying the whole law of Moses. 
some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. That's verse 1. Verse 20 says Gentiles are to do three things, abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. Could also be argued that that's four things. <laughs> Does this prove that the Gentiles only had these obligations? But we need to go on to verse 21. For Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach him since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Therefore the reason they only had to write these three or four prohibitions is because the Gentiles were re receiving teaching every Sabbath. They didn't need a full-on course. So, if you, uh, people try and prove that Sabbath keeping is done away with, but then if you just read on to the very next verse, it mentions that Gentiles are going to the synagogue on Sabbath and receiving teachings. Okay. Claim, Acts 20, verse 7, proves the early church worshipped on Sunday. And this is, the, this is the verse. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. My response. If we take a close look at it, we find that meeting happened Saturday night or Sunday night. This is... There is some controversy whether this was a Saturday evening meeting, liturgically being Sunday, since the day, days begin at sunset, or a Sunday evening meeting using the Roman reckoning of days. At any rate, it was an evening meeting, possibly including a meal, uh, with the mess with the ver with the I'm sorry, I'm tongue tied today. With the passage when we were gathered together to break bread. If the meeting was in fact Saturday night, then what was Paul doing leaving on a lengthy journey on the new Sabbath the following morning? Number two, the meeting was a special meeting before Paul left. It was not a regular meeting. Uh, it says Paul began talking to them intending to leave the next day. They were meeting because Paul was leaving the next day. This was not in a weekly meeting. Three, this was not a communion service. It was most likely just a regular meal. And finally, number four, the purpose of Luke telling the story was not to give a reason for Sunday worship, but to tell the story of Paul bringing back someone from the dead. That's the only reason Luke mentions it at all. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to end it. I'm going to end uh, this part here and uh, continue on later with Romans 14. So, thanks.